It is really an honor to be here with you as we gather to celebrate the inspiration of Martin Luther King Jr., one of my personal heroes and an icon to us all, and to acknowledge the inheritance given to us through the commitment, work, sacrifice, and hard-won gains of Dr. King and the many others who came before us. Because the best way to honor that legacy left to all of us is to add our own part to these gains, do our own part to lighten the burdens of those with whom we share our precious time on this planet and those who come after us, to do our part to hold America to its promise and do our part to mend the world, we must not just come together to celebrate the past, but commit together to working in the present to change the future. Dr. King's vision and mission, after all, were not just about addressing the immediate and enormous injustices of his moment. He wrote, quote, eventually the civil rights movement will have contributed infinitely more to the nation than the eradication of racial injustice. It will have enlarged the concept of brotherhood to a vision of total interrelatedness. At the same time, Dr. King knew that he had to do his part to change the injustices of his moment. In our campaigns and our actions to tackle the immediate and specific, he showed us that we step toward and contribute to the eternal and universal. As a law student inspired by America's civil rights movements, I wrote my thesis in my third year on the importance of ending gay people's exclusion from marriage. Since that was back in 1983, I suppose by now it's fair to call this a mission. I argued then that gay people have the same mix of reasons for wanting the freedom to marry as non-gay people. Reasons that are emotional as well as economic. Reasons that are practical as well as personal. Reasons that are social as well as spiritual, and reasons that resonate in love as they do in law. I wrote that to be denied the freedom to marry is to be excluded from a powerful vocabulary of love and commitment and what the Vermont Supreme Court later called our common humanity. To be denied marriage is to be deprived of an important safety net that touches every area of life from birth to death with taxes in between. I believed that ending the denial of the freedom to marry is preeminently a question of justice, of treating others as you would want to be treated, the golden rule, of fulfilling America's promise that everyone has the right to be both different and equal, and that no one should have to give up her or his difference in order to be treated equally. And ending this exclusion also raises a question of love, helping secure for all our common birthright, the pursuit of happiness, removing barriers and lifting burdens, making it easier for everyone to take care of their loved ones, particularly in tough economic times and through times of crisis, as well as life's ordinary ups and downs. And I concluded that you can't say you are for equality and yet acquiesce in exclusion from the central social and legal institution of this and virtually every other society in history. Now, all prejudice, all discrimination are painful and wrong. But as Dr. King knew, the worst kind of discrimination, the most intolerable, is discrimination by the government itself against any group, any of us. State-sponsored discrimination by the government against a group is what we have seen in this government's discrimination against the brave men and women who happen to be gay serving our nation in the armed forces. And it is that form of state discrimination, discrimination that we happily now have taken an important step to undoing as recently as a few weeks ago. The denial of the freedom to marry is also the other existing form 
of state-sponsored discrimination against gay people in the United States today, and we must end it. As a young attorney at Lambda Legal, I began work in earnest on ending marriage discrimination. One of the very first tasks I set myself was to make people believe we could and would win, that triumph was inevitable. Young as I was, I was taking a page from another inspiration, another wellspring of knowledge and teaching and example, women's struggle throughout the ages for equality. I was heeding then the words of a fighter for women's right to vote back in the 1800s, a woman named Hubertine Eau Claire, the woman who actually coined the word feminism. Ms. Eau Claire wrote back then, if you would obtain a right, first you must proclaim it. I remember back in the 1990s being in my office as my non-gay co-counsel and I were litigating the Hawaii case that launched this ongoing global movement for the freedom to marry. I remember actually clipping newspapers and putting articles in binders. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> any time I could get anyone in the media to report on anything about the words gay and marriage in the same sense. And I remember considering it a good day if I had even one mention, let alone action, that got recorded somewhere by someone. As the historic Hawaii case proceeded, it put forward the life stories of three couples denied marriage licenses by the government, highlighting their love, their commitment, their family stories. The Hawaii case prompted Americans to, in Lincoln's words, think anew about the reality and diversity of gay people's lives and how the denial of marriage actually harms families while helping no one. The Hawaii case invited non-gay people to push past their discomfort and rise to fairness. And the Hawaii case witnessed a ferocious and sustained assault by the opponents of equality. With the struggle joined on this battlefield of marriage, hearts and minds began to change. And by the end of the 1990s, polls reported that two-thirds of Americans had changed and now come to believe that gay people would win the freedom to marry in their lifetime, something they, for the most part, had never even considered just a decade before. In the succeeding decade, the 2000s, we of course went on to win the freedom to marry, first in Massachusetts, the cradle of liberty, and then throughout the 2000s in five more states, in five states total, and our nation's capital, the District of Columbia. 42% of Americans, over 129 million people, now live in states that provide some form of family recognition for same-sex couples and their kids, from marriage to partnership to civil union to recognizing and respecting out-of-state marriages, all this recognition for same-sex couples, gay families, up from zero just a decade ago. Same-sex couples can now marry in 12 countries on four continents, up from zero a decade ago. This year, my organization, Freedom to Marry, the national campaign to win marriage nationwide, hopes to make more big gains. And quite honestly, the biggest problem we face is that too many of those who are with us in support of marriage, and as of last year, that's a majority nationwide, too many of those who support ending marriage discrimination airily say that winning the freedom to marry is inevitable thereby excusing themselves from having to work to make it so. This is our biggest problem. Our second biggest problem is that the opposition, the well-funded anti-gay machine of Freedom to Marry's counterpart campaign, the so-called National Organization for Marriage, or NAM, and those who fund it, and others, the machine the anti-gay forces have built is not going away, but rather continues to funnel money and energy into attack campaigns that serve partisan purposes as well as ideological aims. 
They know they've lost the argument, but they've still got power and money and poisonous rhetoric and are still wielding them against gay families, policymakers and judges, and the Constitution itself. That's our second biggest problem. So with these problems, is the freedom to marry inevitable? There are at least three major reasons to answer yes. The first is generational momentum. Earlier I described the global decade of progress on marriage and gay inclusion. The trends are clearly with those of us who favor the freedom to marry. In 2009, New York Times polling guru Nate Silver put forward a model that used factors such as the year and anti-gay measures such as California's Proposition 8 is on the ballot, factors like the percentage of white evangelicals in a given state, and found, quote, unsurprisingly, there's a very strong correspondence between the religiosity of a state and its propensity to ban gay marriage, with a particular bonus effect depending on the number of white evangelicals in the state. Marriage bans, however, Silver continued, are losing ground at a rate of slightly less than two points a year. So for example, we'd project that a state in which a marriage ban passed with 60% of the vote last year would only have 58% of its voters approve the ban this year. All of the other factors that I looked at, said Nate Silver, race, education levels, party registration, etc., either did not appear overall to matter at all or became redundant once we accounted for religiosity. Nor does it appear to make a significant difference whether the ban affected marriage only or both marriage and civil unions. Now, Silver went on to rank the progression of public opinion in every state, and he concluded that by 2016, quote, only a handful of states in the Deep South would vote to ban gay marriage, with Mississippi being the last one to come around in 2024. He pegged Michigan for 2013. All of this progression is assuming local conversations and our continued engagement. The other encouraging evidence on generational momentum is of course the fact that young people in virtually every demographic, including evangelicals, including those who went to parochial schools and religious affiliated colleges, including Republicans, young people support the freedom to marry. Young people have grown up knowing gay people, not just stereotypes. Young people have grown up hearing the weakness of the arguments against marriage equality and watching them crumble. And young people have grown up seeing gay people married, happiness increased, and the sky not falling. Generational momentum, or in its starkest terms, generational replacement, clearly favors the freedom to marry. Second, there's historical momentum. In my book, Why Marriage Matters, I describe how marriage has always been a battleground for larger questions of what kind of country we are going to have. What kind of country will America be? Questions such as the proper balance between the government and the individual in making important decisions about life and our pursuit of happiness and who should get to make those decisions. Questions like the proper roles of men and women and whether they should be equal and equally free to make those choices in their life and choose those roles. Questions about the boundary between church and state and the difference between religious rights of marriage, R-I-T-E-S, and the legal right to marry, R-I-G-H-T. In Why Marriage Matters, I discuss the history of marriage and show it to be a history of struggle a history of claims of gloom and doom made against those who sought participation and inclusion and fairness within marriage. A history of change. Now these themes were taken up recently by a historian of marriage, 
Stephanie Kuntz, in a Washington Post piece entitled, Gay Marriage Isn't Revolutionary, It's Just the Next Step in Marriage's Evolution. In that piece, Professor Kuntz's analysis begins, quote, opponents of same-sex marriage worry that allowing two men or two women to wed would radically transform a time-honored institution, but they're way too late on that front. Marriage has already been radically transformed in a way that makes gay marriage, she says, not only inevitable, as Vice President Biden recently described it in an interview last year, but also quite logical. Professor Kuntz traces that history of marriage, the shift from marriage as a property or dynastic arrangement to a union based on love and choice of a partner, the discarding of quote unquote traditional gender roles and the subordination of women that was until recently a part of the quote definition of marriage and goes on to conclude quote, today, as the judge noted in the decision striking down California's Proposition 8, quote, gender no longer forms an essential part of marriage. Marriage under law is a union of equals. Professor Kuhn says, if gay marriage is legally recognized in this country, it will have little impact on the institution of marriage. In fact, the growing acceptance of same-sex marriage is an indication that it's not just President Obama's views that are evolving. The acceptance is a symptom rather than a cause of the profound revolutions in marriage that have already taken place. Historical changes in marriage, our understanding of what liberty, equality, and the pursuit of happiness mean and who should be able to share in them all, all these support the freedom to marry. Third, in favor of the inevitability of the freedom to marry, there is also now moral momentum. During last year's federal trial challenging Proposition 8, which stripped away gay people's freedom to marry in California, at least for now, Chief Judge Vaughn Walker asked Charles Cooper, the attorney defending Proposition 8, what would be the harm of allowing gay men and lesbians to marry. Cooper, the attorney for the anti-gay forces, the attorney defending Proposition 8, the attorney who would have defended the discriminatory law in Hawaii that we challenged 14 years before, so we'd had a little time to think of an answer, <laughs> replied to the judge, quote, Your Honor, my answer is, I don't know. I don't know. That pivotal exchange, and indeed the whole trial, showed that opponents of the freedom to marry are not able to defend their opposition on the merits. As in the freedom to marry trial in Hawaii in 1996, the opponents came into court with no evidence, made no coherent and non-tautological arguments, and have nothing to back up their scare tactics and rhetoric. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I was in law school, they taught us this. If the law is against you, argue the facts. If the facts are against you, argue the law. And if neither's on your side, pound the table. <laughs> well, a pound the table strategy is exactly what the opponents of gay people's freedom to marry have opted for in court cases, in waves of ballot measure attacks, and in the dust they throw up through the media. Check this out. The Economist magazine hosted an extended debate online between Noms, Maggie Gallagher, and me just last week. Go and read the back and forth on the website, on the Economist website, and you will see why she and other opponents of gay people's freedom to marry have shifted from actual arguments about gay people or about marriage to a succession of distractions, stoking fears about kids, making false claims about infringement on religious freedom, drumming up allegations of harassment and violence and victimhood, 
and concocting arguments about how we must deny gay people the freedom to marry, she literally says, in order to fight, quote, accidental procreation by heterosexuals. Distractions are all they've got left, that and power and the money to pound the table and pound the gays. As we've seen now in places from Massachusetts to Iowa, from Canada to Mexico, from Israel to Argentina, when marriage discrimination ends, the world does not. Gays do not use up all the marriage licenses. <laughs> Families are helped and no one is hurt. Gay people are of course not the first people to fight against discrimination. We know that and honor that today. Gay people are not even the first people to have to fight exclusion and discrimination on the human rights battleground that, as I've said, marriage has always been. Race restrictions on who could marry whom, like women's subordination in marriage, were ferociously defended by churches, the law, and even public opinion. They were viewed as natural, necessary, and part of the so-called definition of marriage and they only ended with a struggle. Another civil rights icon, John Lewis, quoted Dr. King when he, the congressman, fought against the federal anti-marriage law, the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, back in 1996. Congressman Lewis said on the floor of the House, Dr. Martin Luther King used to say when people talked about racial, interracial marriage, and I quote, Races do not fall in love and get married. Individuals fall in love and get married. The first court to strike down race restrictions on marriage put it this way. The essence of the right to marry is the freedom to join in marriage with the person of one's choice. Each person seeking a license to marry the wrong kind of person in the state's eyes, the justices said, finds himself barred by law from ma marrying the person of his choice, and that person to him may be irreplaceable. Human beings are bereft of worth and dignity by a doctrine that would make them as interchangeable as trains. It's not like when the law says you can't marry the person you love, you can just catch the next one. Because of these powerful moral truths about why marriage matters, and because of the powerful moral claim to fairness that these truths entail, Coretta Scott King was an early supporter of the freedom to marry. She declared, and I quote, my husband, Martin Luther King Jr., understood that all forms of discrimination and persecution were unjust and unacceptable for a great democracy. He believed that none of us could be free until all of us were free. That a person of conscience had no alternative but to defend the human rights of all people. Mrs. King continued, the civil rights movement that I believe in thrives on unity and inclusion not division and exclusion. All of us who oppose discrimination and support equal rights should stand together to resist every attempt to restrict civil rights in this country. So is there moral momentum for the freedom to marry? Well, Bill Clinton, the president who signed that federal so-called Defense of Marriage Act into law back in 1996, has now joined Freedom to Marry in calling for DOMA's overturning. And he now supports the Freedom to Marry itself, as do Laura Bush, Cindy McCain, and even, God help us, Glenn Beck. <laughs> when we were doing the Hawaii case and battling over so-called DOMA in the 1990s, the polls then showed 26% of Americans favored the freedom to marry. Last year, in August of 2010, not one but two national polls reported 
that now 52% of Americans, a majority nationwide, a literal doubling, now are with us. And those who oppose equality and inclusion for gay people are in the minority. We literally doubled support for ending exclusion from marriage in just 15 years. Why is that? Moral momentum. As Dr. King put it most movingly, truth, even crushed to earth, will rise again. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So, is the freedom to marry inevitable? Again, let's turn to Dr. King. Dr. King cautioned us. He wrote, Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. And in his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King wrote, human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God, and without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. It was complacency and faith in inevitability that allowed the anti-gay forces to prevail in the Prop 8 battle in California. Too many non-gay people, indeed too many gay people, just assumed that we were going to win. That making the case was somehow superfluous because the truth was so obvious. That rights could not be stripped away. That momentum and time would take care of needed change. In Argentina, the most recent and to many most surprising country to end marriage discrimination, President Christina Kirchner knew that the change was necessary, not just as a matter of fairness and dignity for gay people, but as an essential step in the maturation and securing of constitutional democracy itself. In 2010, President Kirchner said, the opponents are portraying this as a religious moral issue and as a threat to the natural order, when what we're really doing is looking at a reality, people who are already here. It would be a terrible distortion of democracy if they denied minorities their rights. Prime Minister Jose Zapatero said something very similar when he hailed the advent of the freedom to marry in Spain in 2005. It is true, he said, that gay people are only a minority, but their triumph is everyone's triumph. It is also the triumph of those who oppose this marriage law, even though they do not know this yet, because it is the triumph of liberty. Their victory makes all of us, even those who oppose the law, better people. It makes our society better. But in Spain, Argentina, South Africa, and other places that have led in our movement for the freedom to marry worldwide, leaders and advocates know from their history and their struggles that democracy, human rights, constitutional guarantees of law and equality, and progress itself are not handed to anyone and do not defend themselves. They must be fought for and tended and guarded, as Frederick Douglass wrote. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. But power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Just 15 years ago, in the midst of our Hawaii Freedom to Marry case and the battles in Congress over so-called DOMA, many people, gay and non-gay, believed 
and loudly asserted that the idea of what they wrongly labeled gay marriage was impossible. Now, most believe it inevitable. We've gone in a historical eye blink from impossibility to inevitability, and somehow, for too many, skipped over the part where we must do the work. So is the freedom to marry inevitable? The answer, yes or no, hinges on the difference between, say, five years and 50 years. If the question is, will the cumulative effect of other people's actions, other people's coming of age, other forces, and the very flow of time itself waft us to justice eventually without us having to work for it? Well, yes, maybe, if you want it in 50 years. But if the question is, can we make it happen now, in five years, the answer is yes, if we each make a personal commitment and join the collective effort to do the work, to have the conversations, to make the case. There is no marriage without engagement, not in the United States and not in Michigan. Freedom to marry is the national campaign to win and it has put forward its roadmap to victory. You can read it on our website. It's up to us, however, to take that roadmap and march it, not just wait to be carried or watch change waft along the path. Dr. King told us in that same letter from a Birmingham jail, we must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Civil rights leader Dorothy Haight, whom we lost last year, told us, if the time is not ripe, we have to ripen the time. Is the freedom to marry inevitable? The answer is, that's up to us. This is our time. In the name of those who came before us, in the name of those we love, in the name of those to whom we, like Dr. King, seek to leave a better country and a better world, let's make it so.